Would you take your Bibles? Would you take your Bibles in hand? Thank you so much for that. I don't know who that song was for, but I know it was for somebody. Take your Bibles and when you find your place, would you just stand with me? And uh, I want to read three verses of Scripture. Go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Book of Ephesians, chapter 6. When you find your place, would you just stand to your feet? If you don't have a Bible, I promise somebody next to you will share with you. Book of Ephesians, chapter 6, and verse 4. That's our first text, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. This is what the Bible says. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Turn to the book of Colossians. Next book over, Colossians chapter 3. And verse 21. Colossians chapter 3, and verse 21. The Bible says, Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. The last text, book of Titus. Book of Titus, chapter 2. Book of Titus, chapter 2. Titus is after Timothy. And uh, I'm going to start with verse 1. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, and love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. This is why I want to focus on verse 4. Then they can train the younger women. To love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. I want to teach for a few moments today as a spiritual guide with this thought in mind, raising teenagers without going crazy. Anybody raising a teenager right now or about to raise a teenager without going crazy? Would you just sing with me and ask God to just speak to your heart today and give you exactly what you need? Come on, speak to my heart. Speak to my heart. Speak to my heart. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Give me the words. Give me the words that will bring new life. That will bring Words on the wings, wings of the morning, dark nights, speak to my heart. Come on, lift it. Speak to my heart. Holy Spirit, yeah. oh, message of love, message of love to encourage me, to in lifting my heart from despair. How you loved me and cared for me. Loved me and cared for me. Speak to. Come on, one more time. This is what you're asking, God. Speak to my heart. Oh, Holy Spirit, give me the words that will bring. bring words on the wings of the morning. Speak to my Father, please help us today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the Lord's house. We began a teaching series last week called P 
parents just don't understand and explore the understanding that we as parents must, with reckless abandon, spiritually fight for the salvation of our children and stop allowing the enemy to just take them captive. Because it is apparent, if you don't know, that the devil wants your child. He wants your children so bad because our children represent the next generation. And if he can steal our children away from us, influence him, and place his imprint on of his personality on them, not only will it discourage parents, but it will, he believes, frustrate the plans and purposes of God. But do I have any parents in here today who have decided that you're not going to just simply sit down and accept the status quo of your children, but you have decided to pray, to fast, to fight, and to go after the salvation of your precious children that God has given to you? Because after all, when Jesus comes back, he won't ask you how much, only ask you rather, how much you prayed for, interceded on behalf of, taken seriously the responsibility of, and how much did you represent God to your children. I'm realizing more and more, not only do our children need prayer, but parents need prayer. I said parents need prayer. Uh Uh-huh. Because somebody said that it takes moments of pleasure to create a child, but often a lifetime of pain to raise them. Myriad of emotions fill our minds. We find out that in nine months, we're going to hold a child in our arms. And regardless if we're single or married, our minds are flooded with imaginations on what our child will look like, what will be their chosen career, who they're married, what characteristics of ours will come out in them the most. But whatever rests on your minds, it falls back to this one premise, what kind of parent will I be? Because nobody knows the true pains and joys of parenting quite like somebody who has experienced the different faces of parenting because parents wear a whole lot of hats. Okay, can I, can I give you a couple hats, parents? Where just, just wave at me if I hit one of your hats. You are a doctor. Okay. You're a psychologist. You are a chauffeur. Okay. At times, a policeman or fireman. You are, this is a good one, you are a private detective. I feel it all by myself. You, you are a, a personal chef. Okay. Am I in good company in here today? Um, you are a fashion consultant. <laughs> You're a counselor. Most importantly, a spiritual advisor who who works overtime with no vacation. For some of us today, you have survived through the 2 a.m. feedings. Some of us have survived some toddler temper tantrums. You you survived back to school after summertime woes, emergency room scares, and yet for some reason, the word teenager often causes the most anxiety and frustration. Because being a teenager is a time of incredible transition. Say transition. Transition. I I mean, think of all the changes you went through as a teenager. Physical changes that you didn't understand. Social and peer changes that seemed to switch every week. Changes in your thought process of thinking that you were in love with somebody just because they smelled good, looked incredible, or because you sat next to them in Algebra 1 class. And can I pawn parenthetically that we have a lot of people that aren't teenagers but are dating like teenagers. You thought this was Wednesday. The problem, the problem sometimes is we got folk that are out of the teenage years, but they're still processing like they're a teenager. Teenagers bring out In such a real way, though, through their transition of how close we got to be to God as parents. I mean, really, let's 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 be honest. Who else is going to help you guide 
or rather help you function through the years of raising your teenager? Who, who else is going to help you but God get through the mood swings? The identity crises. Who, who, who's really going to help you get through attitude shifts or an I know it all complex? Who, who's going to help you? This is somebody. Who's going to help you through crashing cars that aren't theirs and, and, and speaking in tongues, speaking in languages, not from other countries, but from their contexts? Who's going to help you get through consistent calls from their teachers? Who's really going to help you pilot and direct you through the tornadoes, thunderstorms, and troubles of raising a teenager but God? Somebody say, but God. Is anybody parenting a teenager today that just needs some help? You're hoping, Lord, help pastor say something today. Get me through these frustrations and help me stop going crazy because I'm about to lose my mind of raising somebody who is not a child anymore. They're transitioning, but I don't know what I'm going to do. Let me preface today's teaching with the understanding that though I'm not a parent of a teenager, my teenage years were loaded with so much transition. <laughs> I felt compelled to use that experience as well as my thorough interaction with parents of teens to kind of teach, and y'all don't push me, I really want to teach today, not preach, to help, to help you navigate through parenting a teenager while keeping your righteous mind. Amen. Uh, the story is told a parent wanted to take his 13-year-old son to see a psychologist. And before he took his son, he went to the psychologist and said, I want you to evaluate my 13-year-old son. Doctor responds and says, okay, he is suffering from a transient psychosis with an intermittent rage disorder punctuated by episodic radical mood swings, but his prognosis is good for a full recovery. Parents said, what does all this mean? The doctor says it means that you have a teenager. <laughs> Parents said, how can you say all of that without meeting or evaluating him? The doctor said, because he's 13 years old. Let me preface today's teaching by just giving you a working definition of a teenager. Can we start there? A transitional. Somebody say transitional. Transitional stage of physical and psychological human development generally occurring during the period from puberty to legal adulthood, it's a process everybody goes through where development takes place. You slow, but you're worth waiting on. It's a process where development takes place. For boys, it may cause a deeper voice, face your hair, while for girls, it may cause more curves or prominent hips because during the development stage, the person is trying to transition from childhood to adulthood. I wish I heard somebody today. In other words, a person's teenage years are spent developing or, or, or metamorphosis into developing somebody to maturing themselves as an adult so that when they become an adult, they still won't be a teenager. I wish I could help you in here today. I don't hear nobody here today. He's transitioning them, Lord have mercy, from childhood to adulthood. And while I'm here, can I part parenthetically and say that God is developing all of us? Yeah. I, I wish I could help somebody today. In, in other words, in other words, what helps you, first of all, as a parent who's parenting a teenager, is to understand that the development that a teenager is going through is likened to the development God is working on you. Because nobody is everything that they should be. I wish I could hear somebody here today. In, in other words, you're not where you want to be. You're not where you were. But God is processing and developing you, but signs of growth will always show that you're moving somewhere. Okay, you missed it. I'm trying to help you. Let, let me help you this way. Um, anybody remember back in the day when you used to have a buy a camera and you used to buy the flash? Okay, you would buy the camera 
and then you have to buy the flash cube and you will put the flash. Come on, don't talk to me like you didn't do it. Don't, don't talk to me like you was in the digital age all your life. You would take the cube and put it on top of the camera and then take the picture and then you would have to. Come on, talk to me, somebody. And, and, and so you would put it so that there would be some light on the picture. And so because society changed, the world changed, and people got tired of waiting for pictures. I'm trying to go somewhere. You're going to catch it in one second. People got tired of waiting pit for pictures to sit into a dark room or to put them in, in a pan of water in a dark. They got tired of watching it. So a couple of years later, they came out with a, with a camera called the Polaroid. I wish I had some company here today. You, you, you didn't have the, the, the Polaroid. You, you didn't have, don't, don't, don't look at me crazy like I was the only one that was so excited when, when we got the Polaroid because a Polaroid was so exciting because you could take the picture and get the results immediately. Uh, okay, okay. I, I think I met some good company. Um, you would take the picture, but as soon as you took the picture, if you were like me, you would take it and then you would... Okay, okay, I, 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 am I in good company today? You, you, you were fanning, and if the fanning wasn't working quick enough, then you would start, <laughs> because you were trying to hurry up and get the development of the picture. But watch this, watch this. If you were like me, sometimes fanning and blowing wasn't getting it quick enough. And if you were like me, you forgot what the direction said. The direction says when you finish taking the picture, you got to set it down in an atmosphere to allow it to develop properly. Because if you find it too much or if you blew it too hard, you would mess up the development of the picture. Come here, somebody. Could it be that with our teenagers, we are so concerned with the end product that we keep pushing them forward in the process. And instead of setting up the environment to make sure that they grow and make sure they flourish and make sure they transition to adulthood, we so busy fanning them forward and blowing them forward that when they get to the place where they could be and be adults, we got too many drive through adults and not slow-cooked seasoned adults. Do I have any company in the building of somebody that needs to stop pushing your child forward and just let them develop and your, your, your mind should be on making sure you put them in an environment to grow. I feel like preaching one more time. Could it be that your child is not everything you want them to be right now because they're developing? Could it be that even though God's character is not pressed indelibly into their life and they're not where you want them to be because they're developing? After all, are you as a parent where you should be? Because God's way of developing you is through a process that some call sanctification. And because you have not got it all yet, you shouldn't expect your child to already be there. But can I give you some just reasons, and I promise I'll take my seat, some reasons why raising teenagers is so difficult. Can I, I just got three of them, that's all I got. I give them to you and I take my seat, I promise. I'm going to give you why raising teenagers is so hard. Can I give them to you? First one is so deep, but it's so simple. Um, teenagers are crazy. Come back. God bless you, teenagers of Bladensburg or visitors, we friends that we have. I love you. Kwame, God bless you. We'll see you after service. But teenagers are crazy. Can I tell you why they're crazy? Contrary to research that was done to the brain some years ago, researchers have found that during the teenage years, the human brain is not fully developed. I feel it all by myself, okay? Okay? During the teenage years, the brain goes through changes called synaptic pruning. Come on, Pastor. Come on, Pastor. 
Y'all going to catch it in one second. It's a process where unnecessary neurons and connections to the brain are eliminated and gray matter is pared down. It's a process called synaptic pruning where God is taking stuff out their brain that they don't need. You, you missed it. You slow. Because I said in raising a teenager is how God deals with you. And with a teenager, he takes a process called synaptic pruning where he takes stuff out their brain they don't need. Come here, somebody. Isn't God pruning you? Isn't God molding you? And taking things out of your life that you don't need, you didn't need her in your life anyway. You didn't need him in your life anyway. The job lets you go, but all your bills are still paid. He might have said goodbye, but somebody else walked in. And for all of us in our stage of development, God is pruning us. Okay, okay. Research also shows that the prefrontal cortex of the brain goes through a wild growth spurt that coincides with the onset of adolescence. The part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, does its most development and maturing during the ages of 12 and 20. Okay, let me help you parents who are raising a teenager because let me share with you what happens in your prefrontal cortex? And tell me, does that not at least help you understand what your teenager's dealing with? It's where emotional control takes place. I said emotional control. Okay. All right. Um, it's where impulse restraint. Can I talk to some people that are not teenagers and, and, and help you understand? Didn't you do some dumb stuff when you was a teenager? Come on, talk to me. Come on. Am I in some good company? You did some things as a teenager, and you said this, what in the world? Okay, okay. W what else? Prefrontal cortex, it's where rational decision-making and cognitive control takes place. Talk to me, nurse, nurse, nurse Courtney. Ain't that the truth? In, in, in other words, the prefrontal cortex of teenagers that enables them to make good decisions is not worked out yet. So you upset because your child thinks they don't need you no more. But it's during the teenage years when they need you the most because they don't understand even what they doing. What you want for dinner? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't even understand myself. You better come in, child, and grab your teenager and help move them through their stage of development. So what you're saying is, what do I do because my child is crazy? They live in a crazy world. And beating them to their sanity is not going to get it. Did you hear what I said? You, you cannot just beat them through their development stage. Can I help you out? Because your child is crazy, this is what you do. You go on a journey of discovery. Say discovery. To find out who your child actually is. Okay. You go through a journey of of discovery to find out who your child is. When you go through this journey, you'll find out two things. First thing you'll find out is that your teenager is just like you. And won't it scare you when your children do stuff that you did yourself? Won't it drive you crazy because you can't really do nothing because the same thing that they did, you know you did, the same lies you told to get out of mess are the same lies they telling to get out of mess? Discovery. You find out your child is just like you. Or you find out your child is the exact opposite of you. And usually what we don't understand, we criticize. So on your journey of discovery, because your child is crazy, 
it will help you in their bouts of craziness because when you don't understand what they do, at least you know who they are. I just helped somebody. Because how many know your kids do something? What are, what are you thinking? What are you, you, okay, roll call. You ever said this as a parent? What are you thinking right now? What are you, what are you thinking? What are you doing? What, what are you doing? Where are you going? Who are you with? Why are you doing that? How come? Why? And, and, and they come up with the same answer but say it in different ways. I don't know. It's because they're crazy. And I, and I need to share this word with some parent today because there's a parent in here today that thinks that something is wrong with their parental skills and you've been praying and you've been crying and you put them in Christian education and you've been doing everything you could and your child is still crazy. Can I give some parents some help today and let you know, don't worry about the teenage years of craziness. All you have to make sure you do is put them in an environment to develop. Can I give you another reason? Why it's so difficult to raise teenagers? And that is that for teenagers, their peer group has become the source of their life. Okay. Um, because you know what, you, what your problem is? You're having a tough time dealing with the fact that the person who used to climb in your bed and wet their bed can I talk about it today and be up under your arm at all parts of the day and would always give you and tell you all information is no longer wanting to really hang out with you and you're frustrated because you're trying to understand what can I do to get my teenager to open up to talk to me, to tell me what's going on. And, and you know what most research says? I read a wonderful book called uh, What Your Daughter Isn't Telling You by Susan Schellenberger who says that most teenage girls do not tell their parents what's going on because they're afraid that the, person is gonna, that the parent is going to reject them. So they dare not open themselves up for, rejecting, for rejection. they rather just keep it. And you're having a tough time with the person whose diapers you used to change, don't want to go to the mall with you no more. Can I give you some help? Okay. Because you're frustrated because you're trying to figure out why does my child want that crazy haircut or strange hairdo? Why they want to wear those clothes and why they want to be like everybody else? Can I tell you what you do? You make sure that they know you love them. I need your parents to wake up and listen to me right now. You have to make sure that your children know that you love them. In other words, the image that they have of themselves has to be coupled by the love you have for them. Because a child that does not know that they are loved won't tend to love other people. And for girls, they got to know that they're loved because a girl that doesn't know that she's loved because girls mature more faster than boys, a young lady will look for an older young man. And a young man that doesn't know that he's loved tends to not love other people. That's why prisons are filled with people who don't feel themselves to be loved. I need some parent to know that regardless of what your child is doing or if they don't want to be around you, you make sure you know they love, they, that they love you. Watch this. Kiss your child. I don't care if they want. Yo, I was telling first service, um, like up until college, my dad still kissed me on the cheek. And I ain't talking about no little peck. I'm talking about where the, where the moisture is still fresh on the cheek. And I was telling first service, I was in middle school. Uh, Ella Manga, I was coming from, from basketball practice. And uh, my, my father came up to me, gave me a hug and a kiss. I'm like, come on, like right now? The team, the team is all here, the coach and everything. And you're going to kiss me right here, right now. And we got in the car. He was like, what's wrong with you? Yo, why did you kiss me in front of all of them? 
He said, I want you to know I love you. Yo, so what? Why did you kiss me in front of all of them? He said, son, some of them dudes don't even know their fathers. I said, so? Why you have to do it there, though? And I'm telling some parent, I don't care if you got to kiss them till you leave your house till they get to school and kiss them all the way to the classroom because when they leave your house and they look for love in all the wrong places, you're going to wish you did more than kiss them. Don't you dare have your kids leave your house without you telling them you love them. Don't you dare let weeks and months go past because you cannot buy your children's affection. And because you work in two and three jobs and you, and you got to catch up on scandal and you got to do. Do I have any company in the building? Because what happens is we spend more time trying to keep up with our status quo of life that we're losing our babies. And you cannot buy your children's affection back by having them walking around in $120 Jordans, but they ain't going nowhere. All right, let me give you the last one. Let me give you the last one. Told you I ain't got much. Is this helping anybody today? Last reason it's so difficult to raise teenagers is because teenagers want to be treated like adults, but still act like children. I told you they were crazy, didn't I? It's often called the 6 or 16 syndrome. All right, all right. Parents, help me out. Am I in good company? Have you heard these statements before? Ma, why are you pressing me so hard? Okay, okay. Um... Why can't I go out with them? Um, why I got to do everything you say? Okay. Has anybody gotten the language of sucking teeth and rolling eyes? Watch this. Watch this. Hey, parents, parents I, I, know, I know what it is. Don't smack them. Watch this. Don't smack them. Their prefrontal cortex ain't worked out. They don't understand that in the African-American context, if you use the sucking and eye-rolling language, that it's usually coupled by hand slaps and fists. So don't get them too bad because they don't understand what they're doing. I told, listen, listen, I told Courtney, I told my mother to shut up when I was a teenager before. I'm still not all together right here because of that moment. Because teenagers are caught between <laughs> my frontal cortex wasn't worked out. It wasn't worked out. It wasn't worked out. Because watch, teenagers are trapped between leaving childhood and not being an adult yet. So you're saying as a parent, what can I do because the cuz I said so approach ain't working? Okay, can I, can I part parenthetically and talk to some kids that are going to try to use some of these principles against your parents this week and right now rebuke you in the name of Jesus and say sometimes parents have to say because I said so because sometimes life is so crucial that they don't have time to tell you all the ins and outs of what you're doing. Does not God sometimes not give us the answers to what we need? Does not God sometimes uh, not tell us why is this going that way and why this is working out that way? God does not always give us the full picture and as parents sometimes you can't have time to tell kids everything that's going on. Watch this, though. Always saying, because I said so, is not going to get it. Because when you go on your journey of discovery, not only are you discovering who your child is, but your child is discovering who you are. 
And when you always say, because I said so, they're going to stop opening up to you. Okay, so watch this. What you need to do is this. Ooh, this is hard, but it's the truth anyway. Well. Tell your teenager about your past mistakes. I know some of y'all were born in the front pew of the church, and some of y'all have just came out the womb singing, glory, hallelujah, I made it over. Some of y'all have a perfect record. You've never needed the blood of Jesus to forgive. I know that ain't some of y'all. It's a few of us in here. You've never needed the blood of Jesus. You don't take communion too much because you're you, you already there. I, I, I know. God bless you. God bless the two of you. But, but for the rest of us in here, we ain't always been perfect. We ain't always been preachers and elders and sing. We have not always had some things together. All of us got a pass. Man, y'all sound like y'all perfect. I, I told Wednesday, sometimes y'all just be making me feel bad, like I'm the only sinner up in this place. Can I talk to you then, Tanya? Am I by myself that sometimes in your past you done done some stuff that you're not comfortable with and that you don't understand? Are we the only ones in here today that that, that, that couple years ago there were some things that you, you, you didn't know what you were doing and you were stuck on stupid and parked on crazy? And the reason why your children sometimes don't respect you is because you're talking about how you got over, but you never talked about where you came from. And why are you getting mad at your child for doing the same thing you used to do but are not helping them prepare for how to not get into it? Go ahead and tell your children you used to cuss. Hey, hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Tell your son you was a rolling stone. Watch this. Watch this. Tell them you were. Because watch this. If your son does not know what he has a tendency for, then he may not know how to get himself out of it. And you come to the altar and come to, oh, just pray for my child. Oh, just pray. No, no, no. Only thing you need to do is open up your mouth and say, son, your dad had to wrestle with some things. So there's some things you might have to wrestle through too. But let me tell you how I made it over. Hey, 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 the most testimonies should be shared, not outside of the, not inside the church or, or, or down by the crack house. But the most testimonies ought to be shared within your house. Child, I used to be strung out on crack. Oh, y'all don't want to talk to me today? All y'all came out the womb singing hymns? Come on, talk to me today. Am I talking to anybody here today? You done been through some stuff? You done did some stuff? You done smoked some stuff? You done drank some stuff? But thank God that he's brought you over, and now you're not going to open up your mouth and tell your child that God done brought you out of some things. The nerve of you to keep your mouth closed about what the Lord has done and about what the Lord is doing. And meanwhile, your children are on their way to hell just because you have not shown them the way to heaven. I don't know why you wearing that. You're going to walk out this house looking like a man. Watch this, parents. Are, 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 you, are you more embarrassed about your reputation or about saving your children? You're not going to leave this house and embarrass me. You're not going to put my name on, on everything. No, 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 no. The real reason are you scared to tell your child what you've done. And at the most crucial time where their decision making is questionable, you going to not help them? Where they need you the most, you're going to be the most dishonest. Because you know what you're doing? You're waiting. Whew. You're waiting till your child moves out the house. And you feel like they can get older to, to understand what you've been through. They have no problem at 16 years old understanding that you used to drink. Right. 
and you're scared that your child is no longer going to respect you as a parent based on what you've been through, but I'm here to tell you when you open up your mouth and expose them to some things, then it lets them know I may can push this button, but I can't push that one. And y'all want to hush your mouth and not tell your children how they can get free like you. Or maybe you're not free. Because the only people that don't share testimonies are people that are not free. So watch this. You're going to keep your teenage son and daughter bound because you're scared of embarrassment. And your child is waiting for that moment of transparency where you take them on a trip or take them on a journey or, or go in their room. I don't care if they say, why are you in my room? Well, the reason I'm in here is I, I pay rent and your room is a part. It's included. And it's not like, it's a set, it's not like you pay for that room. When we send the check for the rent, the, your room is included. It, it's, it's, they didn't give us like a separate price. I, you can talk to them about that. They didn't give us a separate price. All of that is included. So uh, because of that, the space that I now stand in belongs to me. And I'm so tired. Can I preach for a little while? I'm so tired of man be pan be parents who are scared of their children. Stand up on your feet and say, I ain't going to let the devil steal my kids. They're not going to cuss me out in my own home. They're not going to just treat me like I didn't go through nine months of pregnancy. Is there any parent in here that's tired of just playing games with your child and is going to take your teenager back in the name of Jesus? Well, I, 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 I don't want to offend them. The devil is a liar. Take them back. I'm scared. Oh, I'm scared they might cuss me out. I wish you would cuss me out when I'm paying for your food and for your shelter and for your bed and for your tuition and for I wish you would. Hey, hey, the word of God says that he has given you the responsibility of your child and you are responsible to create an environment for development. All right, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. So, so parents, what kind of environment are you creating? I'm starting to learn that our children pick the bulk of their behavior up. Now, I'm not saying some things they don't get it because I'm learning, I'm learning the new kind of words and stuff. Because you know it's some stuff you don't say in your house and your children come home with different words. What, what did you say? But I'm learning that most children pick up a lot of their habits from the home. That aggressive behavior, they didn't get that from school. They see y'all arguing a lot. Oh, y'all don't want to talk today? I know it's tight, but it's right. They, they may have learned how to cuss from you. Watch this. Watch this. This is what I learned. Some of us are scared to fully parent because it makes you raise your level of spirituality. Because you cannot tell your kids to do stuff you ain't doing. Get in your room and read your Bible. Like when they read it, they just supposed to magically transform. Get in there and pray. And when was the last time you had a heart to heart with God? True parenting.
pushes you to raise your level of spirituality. We got to keep telling our kids to do stuff that we ain't doing. Start asking God. Start asking God before you make decisions. Did God really tell you to give him a spanking? Because watch this. Part of parenting is asking God, what do I really do in this situation? Now listen, I, I, I want to be clear. I'm not, I'm not opposed to spankings. Let me let that be clear. I, if I didn't get some, I probably wouldn't be preaching right now. I still, my left side is still a little weak from 87. <laughs> what I'm suggesting, though, is parenting places you on a discovery to find out from God, what do I do in certain situations? L- let me end with this. Because no, no parent can truly parent and be closed-minded. It was a time of day I was telling first service, I was, uh, I think me and my sister was getting a little selfish. I think that's why. She took us here. And one Sunday morning, she said, come on with me. We're going down to uh, feed the homeless. Well, I want to watch these cartoons. Get dressed. Feed the homeless. See, Sister Hayden, I, I'm always like, like crazy when I see parents in church and their kids are at home. And I say, where are your parents? Oh, they wasn't ready in time. The devil is a liar. When it's time to leave the house... And it's not my fault if you ain't want to take a shower. You're just going to be stanking all up in the church. But you getting your hips to church today. She said, get in the car. We're going to feed the homeless. So we begrudgingly got in the back of the cars. You know, uh, gosh, feed the homeless. Uh, feed the homeless. So we get down there. We feed the homeless. We're leaving to go to the car. There's a man outside. My mother realizes didn't have on socks. So she turns around. I said, Mom, what are, you, what are you doing? She starts taking off her socks. and give, I said, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What, what are you doing? I'm giving him my socks. Yo, Ma, we're not rich. You better keep them socks. She said, son, I have some socks at home. But this man needs some socks. And I'm like, man, yo, I mean, why are you just giving people stuff and we need stuff? And she said, when you give to people, God is going to give you more. Amen. And there was quietness from the time we left to the time we got home. And then my mother, I don't, maybe you grew up in a house like mine. We had to write like a paper on what we learned in the experience. Because you just can't beat the sanity into your child. Ask God, God, what different things can I do? Maybe I, need to te- maybe I just need to take them to a prison one day to see based on their behavior where they might be headed. Or y'all don't want to talk? Because watch this. It's all fun and games until the devil really got them. Can I pray for somebody who's parenting teens today? You parenting a teenager? Get up and meet me at the altar. You parenting a teenager? Listen, I know it's rough. I know they're eating you out of house and home. And then, I, I, didn't even, I didn't even have time to get in this. Then they call themselves starting a date. What is that about? You just start sleeping in your bed. Now you want date? You just stopped carrying a lunchbox to school. And now you're talking about dating somebody. Come on, we go together. The devil is alive. We going together home to get your behind to open the algebra book because you're failing. What environment? What environment do you have your teenager in for development? For development. Would you pray while I pray with them? Father, in Jesus' name. At the altar is, or are rather, parents of teenagers. Or those about to move into the teenage years. Would you give them some wisdom, like like crazy wisdom on what to do, on how to act? 
on how to behave. Father, would you just pour into them godly wisdom about what to do in certain situations? We'll be honest, at most times we are lost at what to do as parents. And if we don't keep talking to you, we will not know what to do. We can read a book on how to change a diaper and what formulas to use. We can read a book on how to guard their sleeping patterns and infants. But what book is there on how to create an environment of development to help my teenage child on the way to the kingdom? Who else could tell me that but God? So, Lord, we call on you today to be the source of our strength. So would you give them everything that they need? Would you take out everything that they think they need? Would you meet them at the point of their need? Father, I don't just pray for them. I pray for all of us here who are in a process of development with you. We have some good days. We have some bad days. We have some highs. We have some lows. But thank God you're developing us because... In order for you to develop us, that means you got to come close to us. So thank you, Lord, for not giving up on us. Thank you for not being embarrassed like us. Thank you for not being embarrassed by us like we're embarrassed sometimes of our kids. When we foul up, you don't say, oh, I don't know them. When we ask for apologies and and, and forgiveness over and over about the same thing, you don't turn your back on us. But you open your arms and you love us. Help us to love our kids like you love us, regardless of what they're on right now. So that ultimately, they'll be saved in your kingdom. Because your word says that you'll contend with us and you'll save our kids. So we hold to the promises of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.